Good to see you, Sean. Good to see you as well. Yeah. Um, so we, we were just talking about kind of the blossoming Miami tech scene happening and your decision to go there. Uh, yeah, it would be good to know kind of your insights around that. Yeah, I Miami right now reminds me of New York back in 2003. It's an emerging tech scene. Uh, it has, it has uh, some great features, but it needs some development. And I kind of like that dynamic. New York in 2003, it was, it was pretty uh, strange to stay in New York and start a tech company. And that's where I started Shutterstock. And um, I think Miami has, has, has an amazing, um, uh, has some amazing components to it. It's super international. It has the start of a great tech scene. I think we can build this into something much bigger here. Mm. And what, if you were to look back in 2003 as entering in, in, in a new tech scene, were there certain advantages that came with that, that perhaps doesn't come with Silicon Valley or more established areas? Yeah, I think starting a company today in Silicon Valley is super difficult. Uh, you're competing with, uh, you, you know, it's, it's not a big town. You're competing with a lot of really deep pocketed uh, businesses that are entrenched there and part of the infrastructure. Uh, Miami doesn't have that yet. And, and it's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I'm finding people, it takes a little bit more work, uh, but I'm finding some really smart people that are local engineers or operators um, that can help build some amazing stuff with us. So it's pretty exciting. That's great. That's great. Well, I, I want to certainly dig deeper into your story. Of course, you're the founder of Shutterstock.com and it's, it's something that you have started about 20 years ago at this point. How crazy is that for you? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's uh, about 18 years ago. Yeah. 18, oh, 18. Yeah, it'll be 19 this summer. So yeah, I mean, it, it goes by pretty fast, but uh, when you're building something and having fun, it, 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 uh, it, it, it'll go even faster. Definitely. Well, I, def I want to go deeper into kind of the story that allowed you to start Shutterstock and get the idea um, maybe it might be good to start with maybe in your teenage or childhood. When you look back when you were 10 or 15 or even seven years old, do you remember what you wanted to do when you grew up? Yeah, I started learning how to code in elementary school. Um, I had, uh, you know, my idols were, uh, were Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. My, uh, my interests were uh, computers, and, and at w wherever I could find one, I would uh, be on that thing for a long, long period of time. And, and I was uh, go ahead, sorry. Keep it. I was I would find software, try to decompile it, and learn how it worked. And um, yeah, that, that that was that was what I was interested in from from a very young age, actually. Is that just something that your your parents got you into through? some sort of a program like in summer camp or it was just a natural inclining for you to navigate towards? Uh, my dad was a science teacher. My, uh, my mom was a teacher also. Uh, and I learned, I learned electronics when I was pretty young and I was soldering together circuit boards and oh, wow. in, uh, yeah, uh, when I, I remember when I was 10 years old doing that. So, um, it was pretty fun. Uh, and, and so, I just kind of went with it and eventually moved from hardware to software. Interesting. What were some of the things that you were circuiting up? My brother is actually an electrical engineer, so I've been in his labs and him digging into these things as well. What were some of the things you were trying to build? They were um, a lot of these electronic kits, um, like these little robots uh, or um, these kits that would allow you to, you know, as a circuit board and learn how integrated circuits work and basic logic. Um, it was a lot of that. Mm, amazing. So then you went from hardware into software. I know you've had close to a dozen startups. A lot of people may not know this before even the idea of Shutterstock came from. And infamously, you were created one of the first web pop-up lockers. I was actually doing some research around a company that's kind of leading this space. I think one of them is uh, IO owned by a company in Germany where they own Adblock Plus doing 40 million 
uh, did 40 million in 2018 that I'm probably doing a lot more these days. I mean, when you look back in terms of like some of these ideas that you had and pioneered and to see these companies becoming big businesses, like what's kind of your initial reactions of seeing these successes? Yeah, I mean, I, w one of the first pop-up blockers, uh, build, building one of them, it was great. And, and basically, I was just trying to solve my own problem. It was 1999 or so, and, you know, browsers were becoming more ubiquitous, but so were pop-ups. And the tools weren't built into the browsers yet. There was no language to build extensions or plugins in the browsers. Um, and what I did was was I built, uh, hacked uh, together a, a plugin for for Internet Explorer, which was the browser back at that time, and uh, it sold a lot uh, until Microsoft built it into their their browser, and then my uh, my company essentially got disrupted out of business. Got it, got it. And then uh, did you end up selling the company or did you just shut it down afterwards? No, it was, I mean, it, it, I evolved into a privacy and security company called Surf Secret, which ran for a few more years, but eventually uh, Shutterstock, which was the place that all the marketing images for my other companies went, became the company that I started to build. Got it. Got it. Which is shut our stock as we know it today. Um, yeah. You know, I think I think a lot of people don't focus on these stories and these probably lessons and obviously some of the mistakes that you may have learned before starting the main company that most people know you as today. If you were to look back, what were some of the core lessons you learned from these ten different startups? that eventually allowed you to have this, the, the, the wild success with Shutterstock. This could be uh, finding the right market, the right product, or maybe some of the execution strategies that maybe have altered since these previous startups. Yeah, I mean, it was it, one of the main things is, is I, I learned to do everything myself before handing it off. Uh, that was super important. Uh, I did the marketing, I did the engineering, I did the customer service. These are all really important uh, features uh, for me to learn. Uh, there were jobs for me to learn before I handed them off. And even even today, I think back to those those experiences as as really important parts of the uh, the journey, actually. Got it, got it. And was the difference that before you were doing it, but you weren't delegating these tasks to other people that allowed you to scale the company or was it just a different market? I eventually delegated uh, quite a bit, but um, but learning to do it yourself, I think is super important from the beginning, even if you can delegate it right away. And in this fundraising environment we have today, I think people are delegating a little too fast. I was probably a little too slow to delegate, but I think, I think the delegation happens a little too fast sometimes. Mm, you mean like there's so much capital out there that people are able to people hire fast and and yeah and yeah. pass off some of the uh, details that you know you may have to kind of absorb on your own for a little while. Right, because how do you know what to delegate if you haven't been in the weeds and at least long enough to know what issues could come up as you start to scale an operation like that? Exactly. Huh. That's interesting. Um, so then the idea uh, of Shutterstock came into the picture, of course. And where did the name Shutterstock come from? Is it just, uh, do you remember back in the days when you were brainstorming the names and uh, trying to figure out which ones felt the right company name for you? I was, I was iterating through, through different names and um, I, think, I think it worked out well. I was looking for something catchy that kind of described what, what, what I was doing. And I was thinking about a fast moving marketplace. I was thinking about people uploading images, people downloading images and kind of this super fast moving marketplace. I mean, today the, uh, the, the marketplace moves at around like six or seven images sold per second. So, wow. you know, that, I think that name kind of reflects that. That's interesting. And when you first envisioned the idea, is, is this kind of what you envision is, is, is these marketplace of contributors and creators, or did it shift over time from the moment that you've had the idea? Um, it, it's it's shifted uh, a bit, but the core part of Shutterstock is the same. It's a two-sided marketplace. It has millions of buyers and millions of sellers. Um, and there's a data component in the middle of the flywheel that feeds uh, our product team 
uh, to develop the next features and functionality for uh, that marketplace. Um, we've obviously added a lot of things like 3D imagery, sound, footage, uh, work, work workflow features, uh, digital asset management features, and it's becoming a full fledged uh, kind of workflow solution today, which um, which is pretty exciting. Uh, that was interesting what you said about the flywheel. So, can you elaborate a little bit more on what you meant by the product is designed to give your product team a faster flywheel to to iterate on the on the, on the next features? Yeah, the flywheel um, is the is the two sided marketplace. More contributors bring more images in. More buyers download those images. More data is collected. Um, and that, that increases the amount of images that come in, increases the amount of people downloading images. And uh, in, in the center is, is, is the core flywheel, um, which is the product and engineering team constantly developing new features and functionality. Got it. Got it. Right. And I guess the more tech people today, they kind of more know Amazon's flywheel as this kind of the more popular ones that, that, um, that is, is talked about more in the mainstream media. If entrepreneurs, um, well, I guess first of all, like, how is a flywheel and having a flywheel for a business contribute to the success of a business? Is it a pretty necessary thing for entrepreneurs to think about pretty early on in their business? And is this something that you recommend founders do? I mean, two side marketplaces are really hard to start, but once you start them, you have this this flywheel that can move really fast. And that's, uh, that's an advantage if you can get it going. It's, it needs to be bootstrapped though. Um, you know, in the beginning we didn't have photographers and we didn't have buyers. Um, I was the first, uh, contributor to the, the, the flywheel contributor. Number one. Sure. Sure. It takes a while to build that up. And so you need to get buyers buying images that bring in other sellers and you kind of need to, um, you know, prime that, that flywheel to, um, takes a lot of energy at first, but later less energy to keep it going. Right. And that's kind of one of the interesting things about your journey is that throughout these 10 oh. different startups that you started and Shutterstock is you had this solo founder journey, which for starting a marketplace in a relatively new market, uh, along with being the solo founder, it, it must have been incredibly difficult. I mean, you must have hustled to really start this company plus get this marketplace up and going and build a software. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, any startup's going to take a massive amount of hustle, but it's kind of how it works. And, and that's what we did. Mm. Got it. Got it. Um, so wow. you, so you did make this unique choice and, and I hear this from several people now, I think Mark, Mark Suster, who is the, uh, the partner at upfront also talks about this idea of, encouraging people to hire co-founders or multiple key early executives where you can be generous with the equity, but it can remove some of the downsides of this immediate preconception that people have in order to go 50-50 with a partner or sometimes, you know, 33-33-33. Having been what you have been through, looking back, what are your thoughts on this versus co-founders who choose to go at at 50-50, being an operator and also now an investor? I mean, you can, you can do this a lot of different ways and it depend, people do it, people start companies in all, in all different ways. I mean, I, I just happened to be an engineer that started uh, uh, the company myself and brought on some C-level executives after I was a solo founder. Um, but uh, other people have had success in other ways. I mean, there's really no, there's no real answer. It's just what you feel comfortable with. And I don't know, maybe if I had two other co-founders I split it equally with, it would be a $30 billion company today instead of a $3.5 billion company today. Sure. Who knows? I mean, there, there are plenty of uh, examples both ways, right? Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's always interesting to think about it in hindsight, but probably not the best use of time in many cases as you're wanting to move forward. Um, but yeah, it, it was interesting to hear Mark say that if you are confident, if you feel comfortable, then it could make sense in many ways to go as a solo founder. Uh, but a lot of people don't want to do that because it does come with 
a lot of doubt. Starting a business comes with struggles and and kind of the you know, a lot of times the depression and the loneliness. I mean, as a solo founder, how did you deal with that? Or is this did you just kind of always have the personality of just striving forward and, and moving on? Or, do, or or how did you? Uh, yeah, did you have people around you that can help you around that? Um, I didn't have people around me that could help, but I, you know, I was, I was just focused on figuring it out and getting it to work. Um, I focused on every single detail. I looked at, you know, everything, every piece of data that was coming towards me. And I said, this is just a problem I have to solve. How do I bootstrap this marketplace? Um, mm. and eventually, eventually I was able to figure it out. It's, uh, it was hard, but it, you know, it, it was possible. Right. Right. Just took many, many years. Um, and, and another interesting part about your, your journey is, is, is your decision to bootstrap pretty early on. You have a good piece on, uh, about, in Vox called The Myth of VC uh, in, in 2014, where you talked about your personal journey and obviously the downsides of, of raising VC that you know a lot of first-time entrepreneurs may just not understand the secondary, third consequences of that. Can you talk to us a little bit about your thoughts around this? Yeah. I mean, if you don't need the money, I, I, I don't think you should raise it. Um, you could raise money for a couple of different reasons because you actually need the cash at the time to invest in the business or because you're looking to bring on some investors that are going to help you get to the next stage. You don't have to raise money. I mean, there are plenty of businesses out there that have not raised anything built really lean, um, cap tables and, and, uh, and our businesses for you know decades. Uh, you know the, the the you can go for a square earth strategy, or you can you could uh, you could raise uh, very little money and own a bigger portion of a smaller business. There's uh, there's no real answer here. Um, later on, you know, later on in in my career, which is now you know now I'm 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 thinking about this a little differently. I used to um, you know I was CEO of Shutterstock. I still own close to 40% of it as a publicly traded company. Um, and you know, when we went public, I was around 70%. So I, that was a different cap structure than, than, than a lot of, uh, startups go through. Um, today I, I raise money a bit faster because I'm, I'm just in a different seat. I'm executive chairman of many things. Mm. And, uh, you know, but, but if, if I meet someone who wants to, you know, go full on CEO and really use, you know, use every minute to their advantage, then, yeah, I may encourage them to raise a little less money mm. and own a bigger portion of the business. Got it. Got it. And obviously, um, eventually, um, even before you went public, you did decide to raise a little cash. It, w- were there certain decision factors that went into at a certain point where you said, okay, like it, it may actually make sense to raise some money? Uh, what are some of the decision points that enabled you to feel comfortable? raising money because uh, you must have seen a bigger upside at that certain point of raising money around that. Yeah. I mean, well, well, Shutter, Shutterstock itself did a secondary, but the first outside money to hit the balance sheet was the IPO. So that's a, that's a different type of, of story. Um, today the companies I work with are raising money because it's a little bit more competitive of an environment and also um, speed is an even bigger uh, differentiator today than it was back then. I mean, you, you always had to move fast to start a business, but today, um, not only is money a lot, uh, money flows quicker, but um, it, you know, you're, you're also dealing with if you're going to start something, there's probably five or six people that have the same idea as you at the same time. So you have to be mindful of that as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there 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 are competing kind of opinions around the fact that the more a company raises that you know particularly not not in a winner takes most market oftentimes they end up doing worse in some ways i think one example that fred wilson gave was uh duck duck go where it's raised three million versus a competitor that i actually forgot they raised 60 million and did you look at the stats of their traffic numbers and the success that they had um you know obviously there are odd cases like that uh and then shutterstock is probably one a good example of that yeah that's right Sure, like raised very little and uh, it was very efficient with whatever whatever it did raise, especially at that. I mean, sorry, it's, it's raise started at the IPO, which was you know over a decade into its journey. Got it. Got it. 
Um, and to get to Shutterstock uh, to grow to where it is today with very little money, are there <laughs> certain you know, silver bullets that you were able to identify and, and levers that you were able to pull pretty early on that allowed you guys to grow organically that perhaps some of the competitors just didn't really know how to leverage? We were just uh, maniacal about growing. Every single day we'd come to the office and just add a new language or focus on a certain metric. And, and you know, today that's kind of built into the Shutterstock culture as well. Um, there, you know, it took over a 20-year period, the company is now over $700 million of revenue and over 20% EBITDA margin. So it's a solid company, but you know, that took every single day for almost 20 years, just building, building, building. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's always interesting to see here founders and, and that have rose and, and, and built up their, their corporate structure. They always look at it as like their kind of little teenager kid because they see bits of their personality that's embedded into the culture. And I think Daniel Eck talks about this um, from Spotify where he has a kid now and he also has this other kid, which is Spotify, and he goes into the office and he can see sometimes baffled by these small little quirks that he likes about himself, but some of the things that he doesn't like about himself in the culture. Did you find something similar in there? And was this something intentional that you've done that other founders can learn from to be able to really build this, this, this culture that lives on after you're gone? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, you're going to, there's going to be unintended consequences to certain things that you do uh, when you're trying to build that culture. I mean, I look, I want to build a successful company that people love to work at where people who wanted to be there wanted to win. Uh, and the people that didn't want to win left. Uh, and, and we had, you know, we still today have an amazing culture of just people that, that want to build, want to win. Uh, and we get, we get better every, every day, every month. Got it. Got it. Here. Um, so filtering is, it seems to be like a key thing when it came to interviewing and hiring people. What are some of these key questions that you may have asked? Um, and what are some of the ways that your team were able to filter out a lot of these key people that now ended up making a big impact in the organization? I mean, there've been so many different, there've been thousands of people that have come and gone through Shutterstock and we have, we have, uh, I mean, today I'm not CEO. I, I became executive chairman a year ago and gave the, the CEO position to our COO at the time, uh, Stan Pavlovsky, and he's, he's doing an amazing job. Uh, and he built up his own team. I mean, every time you've had a new leader come in, they've built a new team and that's how it usually works. Uh, today we have, uh, a different team than we did, you know, five years ago, but it's the right team for the right moment in the business. And, uh, and and they're doing great right now, actually. But they're different cultures every time. And Stan's going to build his own culture. And I talk to him every day about uh, keeping the, the, the company uh, growing as fast as it possibly can. Got it. Got it. Well, I know it's never an easy moment for the, the founder, particularly like yourself that's been around for 18 years, started alone as well to make that decision to end up leaving you know certain f founders and ceos talk about the best process to bring in the replacement as a ceo so that the, the organization can live on i think reed hoffman talks about the idea of just bringing on someone internally and jeff weiner who's now who is now the i don't know if he's still the ceo actually at this point but he was early on brought in um how did you approach this you know early on to ensure, knowing that you're a solo founder, that you didn't have a co-founder that can just replace you as a company. I mean, I always had a team that that could take over if if I needed them to. Um, I always had a president or chief operating officer, and um, uh, and succession super important. So I was always I was always thinking about um, uh, how I was building myself out of the business. I mean, eventually by the time Stan took over, it was pretty easy for me to leave. Mm. Um, I'm still involved in the business, but I don't have any direct reports. Um, chairman of the board and Stan reports to the board as well. Um, I talk to Stan every single day and I'm the largest shareholder, but, 
it's 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 a it's a different dynamic now. But um, you know, I, I was always thinking with the board on on how to how to build succession into the into the team. Got it. Got it. Um, and, and when someone like Stan, when you are the largest shareholder, I mean, how how do you make sure that he is fully motivated as you were, if not more, to to ensure that the, the you know the organization is able to continue to, to to thrive? What are some of the incentive structures that you guys have in place, or what are some of the general things that you recommend other entrepreneurs to put in place? Yeah, I mean, well, the first thing is finding someone who who uh, who wants to do this job and, and is energized by it every day. I mean, mm. finding someone who's who's interested in, in building marketplaces. Uh, it's a marketplace. It's a tech company. We sell media. Um, you know, th- these are features that you, you, you have to be embedded in the person. Um, and then from there, I mean, yeah, we have a performance share structure where um, you know our compensation is aligned to. Uh, how well the company is doing, and and um, it's a meritocracy, right? Sure. Uh, people will 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 succeed in the business. Got it. Got it. Well, I want to talk and and close off with this new journey that you're on. You decided to leave the the founding uh, company that you started that that allowed you to have the success success that you have now, and the company is now called Pareto. Where did the name come from? Which is Bit of a coincidence, by the way, because we actually had Richard Cock on the show, who wrote the eighty twenty principle, just on our last episode, and I was like, Perito, this sounds very familiar. Uh, what is the thesis behind Perito? And for some people that don't know about the Perito principle, what is the underlying thesis around that? Yeah, so it's all about the eighty twenty rule. You know, there'll be there'll be lots of things you do every single day, but there'll be, you know, there'll be the 20% that have the highest impact. And the key is to figure out what that 20% is and focus more on that. Um, you know, it's, you know, in an investment portfolio, you may have 20% of your investments that kind of bring up the entire average of the, of the whole, uh, portfolio in a company, in a business, you'll have 20% of your employees that are excelling and, and, and building, um, you know, the kind of 20x coder type style uh, 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 engineers, for instance. Um, these are these are important things to remember as you as you're building a business because you can compound very quickly if you can identify what that 20 percent is. Mm. And uh, I guess we wanted to call it Pareto Holdings to remind us of, of that fact. Um, it's it's something we constantly remind ourselves. Uh, is is important, and everything we we look at, we look at through that lens uh, to try to figure out and make sure that we're focused on our most impactful ideas and have the most impactful people around them. Got it, right. and got it, and it's totally aligned to how to how I think as well. And I think Richard, one of the things that he mentioned is that the eighty twenty principle, the Pareto's law, it, it can go beyond. The business and the and the professional life in many senses a lot of the times it can go into your relationships thinking about who are the 20 percent of people that bring you 80 percent of happiness or thinking about the you know your happiness or your health uh, so i think it's a really powerful framework for 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 entrepreneurs to think about um beyond this idea of applying the Pareto principle i'm curious to know knowing the entrepreneurs and 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 the founders that you have consulted with and invested in what do you think believe what do you think is what separates the good entrepreneurs to the ones that are wildly successful from uh from each other yeah yeah and this is a question we ask ourselves a lot because we have a lot of ideas and we're looking for operators we're looking for a lot of uh those operators here in miami and we're looking for a certain type of drive uh in 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 these people that were that we want to put in these positions and you know it's hard i mean some of it's random some of it you know people don't know if they have it um some of it is is kind of learning what it is to be a founder you know um but you know sometimes they'll meet someone they have that chip on their shoulder they'll have that kind of maniacal look in their eyes and that's important you know because uh when things get hard and they inevitably do when you're an entrepreneur uh sometimes multiple times a day um you need to be able to like push through these these really hard problems and 
kind of bash through these walls to get to the next phase. And if you let them distract you and push you into the um, uh, place where you're not making progress, um, it's very hard to succeed. So, uh, you know, it's, it, it's a feeling it's, you know, some people are, are built for it. Some are not. Um, and, you know, we're, we're getting better through, through kind of meeting people and understanding what they've done and their experience and how they respond to certain questions and how they take on certain tasks. Um, but it's, there, there isn't a clear answer here. It's, it's actually a very difficult thing to solve for. Yeah, I, I want to make sure that people can find you online and, and of course, check out Pareto. I don't think we need to plug Shutterstock necessarily, but we'll definitely uh, need to plug in Pareto and your social media handles, which, which we'll definitely have in the link below. Um, uh, I think I went to your, your your personal site, but that wasn't currently active. That's not something that you're investing much in. Yeah, I mean, uh, everyone knows where to find Shutterstock, but Pareto is at Pareto20.com. Mm-hmm. And it's... Uh, it's our it's our website where you can apply for the Pareto Fellowship, um, where we're funding um, several companies here in Miami at this moment. Uh, we welcome any operator to apply with their idea or without an idea, um, and we will uh, reach out to the ones that uh, we want to start companies with, and we will start several companies with uh, this fellowship. Beautiful. And the last question, John, is when you look at back at your your journey as an entrepreneur uh, or just as a professional, are there moments that today you still look back where perhaps this big thing was such a devastating moment for you or a decision that didn't go your way, that didn't work out? But when you look back now, you could say, damn, like, I am really glad that didn't happen because this opened up this door and this door or I wouldn't be doing this. Can you reflect back on these moments for yourself? Yeah, there were several times along the way that um, I got buyout offers for Shutterstock. I didn't take them. And uh, every single time, it's been a great idea. <laughs> Not to. <too. laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Awesome, John. Well, I appreciate your time and uh, all the great advice that you've provided. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. And we'll see you guys next time. Great. Thanks, John. 